Thank you. Thanks, Minerva. Um, I don't remember that gig with the guitar and the neck cap, but, uh, but... I've got the picture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Anthony Weiner, you got the picture? So, uh, I can't really deny it, so I won't deny it. Um, anyhow, thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. Thank you, uh, Santa Clarita Valley Democratic Club and Minerva and Todd uh, so much, and, and a lot of you I know already, some of you I don't. Uh, Steve Brooks from Progressive Democrats and the uh, LA chapter. Uh, thank you for being here too. Um, my name is Bill Honigan. I always start with, hi everybody. Hi. 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 There you go. So one more time. Hi everybody. Hi, hi. Dr. Bill. There you go. So make sure we're all uh, you know energized and ready to go here. Fired up and ready to go, right? Um, yeah, I'm going to add a few things. I was very glad that uh, Dr. Gene uh, presented his case for Medicare for All. So um, I'm going to give you facts and figures. And Minerva mentioned we have to base our arguments for reform on facts and figures, on data, on hard, cold data. Um, Joe presented uh, also very compelling in the, in the cancer research and the stories about um, uh, other countries' uh, uh, very compelling stories and really heartfelt stories for the case for economic and social justice. And we may or may not feel we need that or, or have to or see the crisis, you know, like uh, like Dr. Joe does, uh, see the crisis every day in what she does. Um, I'm an emergency room physician. I'm on the front lines. When people fail in the system otherwise, they end up in the ER. And if you have an emergency, you end up in the ER along with all those people who just failed in the system. It's been that way for a long time in this country, and there are certain parts of our system that allow that to happen, in fact, breed it, and that's because there's a whole lot of money involved. So I'm gonna start with a little story and then show you some slides that I think are very, very compelling. Um, first of all, uh, I didn't have enough for every seat, but at every table there should be a flyer that looks like this, which is from Senator Mark Leno's office, uh, on SB 810, which is the new single-payer bill for California, and it has a couple of the uh, graphics that I'm going to use here, very compelling, um, but it also has a, a very strong economic argument, and it, and it goes a little like this. Um, who here can tell me what single-payer is in three words or less? Dr. Gene. Medicare. Medicare for all. Okay, that was supposed to be an easy question. Okay, here's the harder one. Who can tell me in three years, in, in three words or less, what the public option is? We're screwed. <laughs> and I would, I would propose that it's Medicare for all when it's the most robust public option. Remember that term, robust public option. So that means that the insurance companies would still be in existence and would compete with a public plan based on certain uh, things that we that the government could throw in there as incentive to belong to the public plan. And then the private plans would have to compete. Okay? And I'll start with a little story. Um, I, I am a Democratic Party activist, very proud of that. I uh, have been all my life, and I feel the Democratic Party uh, supports the, the issues and the social and economic justice and, and the issue of peace especially that, uh, that I personally support and have all my life. Um, I think all, all politics uh, or all issues are political ultimately, and I think you, know, you have to take a side. Not always, you don't have to declare yourself of one party or another. Um, I organized for a group called Progressive Democrats of America, uh, PDA, and uh, most of you have the green and blue sticker on, on your body at this point or in your pocket that says windmills not weapons. We have another one I ran out of that says healthcare not warfare. You might have heard of that expression before. Um, but it's a question of choice. It's a question of priorities. So we could have healthcare not warfare. We could have education not warfare. We could have energy conversion not warfare. And there are progressive Democrats in Congress, in local office, that you can support that will vote that way. So we have Greens, we have Independents, not too many Republicans, but some of them. Uh, I live in Orange County. I'm willing to talk to Republicans. I do all the time. Uh, and uh, so I invite you to be a part of our organization. You can reach me at uh, Progressive Democrats of, More, uh, of America website. That's on your sticker, Dr. Bill at pdamerica.org. You can reach me at any time. I'd be glad to send you this PowerPoint. Um, I'm going to show you some slides very quickly here. 
that uh, unfortunately, usually I have longer to present, the, uh, but uh, not 45 minutes, more like 15 minutes, but I'll try and do it in 10 minutes. And, um, uh, and you may have questions afterwards, you can feel free to contact me that way. Um, little story, I was uh, campaigning for my candidate in Orange County this last time, uh, Loretta Sanchez, anyone know her? She's a good person, she's a blue dog. Not real happy with that, but she often votes our way, but she is a member of the Blue Dog Caucus. So none other than former President Bill Clinton comes out to support her at a rally on the courthouse steps in Santa Ana. So being on our county central committee, I get the priority seating or standing, I guess, uh, where I can stand in the front. Uh, I don't stand up behind the candidates because, you know, those are what they call the butt seats. They're, all you can see is their butts when you're talking. So don't take the butt seats, but I did take a, you know, a standing position in the front and uh, and was able to shake uh, Bill Clinton's hand and I thought you know I hadn't been able to do that before and I thought I'm not going to just shake his hand I'm going to ask him a question so I asked Bill Clinton I said Mr. President when are we going to have single payer and I wore my white jacket he knew I was a medical person or you know at least uh, maybe one of the village people <laughs> in disguise, but uh, so, he, so he stands there and he lectures me on the subject for about three minutes and everybody in the, around me said, wow, he talked to you for a long time. And I went, you know, yeah, it was great. Um, the bottom line was, he said, we're going to have single payer. He says, we're getting there. He says, we're going to have it when businesses understand how much money they're going to save. And that's one of those graphics on that little flyer right there is how much small businesses especially save money per employee uh, and then big businesses too, which are a little less likely to, to go with this because they're tied in with other big businesses, as you'll see. Um, so that was Bill Clinton's perspective. A week later, I get to ask the same question of Barack Obama. At the, at the rally at, at USC, I did the same thing again. I wore the white jacket and I snuck in with the... Uh, uh, UC Irvine Democratic Club students who they had the butt seats but I stayed in the front there where I could shake his hand and uh, and I, I got to ask Barack Obama the same question I said Mr. President when are we going to have single payer and he said we're taking it step by step and we have to protect the gains we've already made and that's you know Bill Clinton's the consummate corporatist in my opinion and then Barack Obama is a an incrementalist he wants to take this baby steps little by little, or what some people call the practical progressive. Well, I'm going to present a case to you that, like Joe says, we, we don't have time to deliver the baby, you know, part by part. Um, we're in a crisis situation in healthcare. And like Dr. King said, it's all about the fierce urgency of now. So this data, you could switch, sorry if you didn't get to read that, is compiled by a group called Physicians for National Health Plan, or Health Program. Um, if you don't know them already, they've been around for 30 years or more. Uh, they are uh, physician academics, largely, or was founded by physician academics at the Harvard Medical School, School of Public Health. No bunch of slouches here, okay? This is uh, compiled data that they use for, to come up with things like how we're doing compared to other countries. Uh, for example, how much does um, healthcare cost in this country compared to other industrialized nations. Uh, anyone know how much more we spend on healthcare than other industrialized nations? Twice. Twice. Twice as much. And for that, what position are we in the world standing in, say, in, in terms of outcomes? 37. 37. 37. We're here over 37. <laughs> All right. We're not 36. We're 37. We're trying to be 36. If you're 37, you're about tied with Slovenia. So if people say we have the best healthcare in the world, that's not true. Slovenia has healthcare that's as good as ours, and other countries, you know, 36 of them have better healthcare than we do. Okay, and, and here's the data that shows you what. Let's talk about the uninsured. Next. This was an estimate based a few years ago, 46 million people. How many people do we have in, in the United States of America? About 300 million people? Okay, so as many as, this number is now adjusted up to about 60 million, as many as one in five, one in six, one in five people walking on the street don't have any insurance at all. Next slide. And what that largely results in is this. This data, as you can see, it's footnoted at the bottom, and by the way, contact me if you want this PowerPoint, because I'm going to go fast, was compiled in 2002. 
At that time, no, nope, thanks. At that time, um, what they attributed to uh, uh, a lack of access to a physician resulted in about 20,000 deaths per year in this country. These are avoidable deaths. We're talking about that number now and data that's, that's uh, uh, soon to be published, it was compiled in 2009, is upwards of 50,000 people. And I, I, I gave a talk recently to some at-risk youth in the city of Garden Grove who think of going to college, and I asked them all, who's been to Angel Stadium? They, they all raised their hand. I said, anyone here know how many people are in Angel Stadium? And a bunch of them, you know, about 50,000 people, you know, or 44,500 people. They knew the exact number, I didn't. I said, Imagine a stadium filled with people and all those people died this year because they couldn't see a doctor. And the crowd just went, whoa. You know? So, I mean, we have to get our heads around these figures. Next, please. Sorry. Oh. Second. Right. Got distracted. Yeah, there we go. It's not just the uninsured, it's the underinsured as well. Next. This is a slide that shows percent of people who have to spend more than 10% of their disposable income for health care. Um, and you can see the U.S. population in general, about a fifth of us will ultimately have to spend about uh, greater than 10% of our disposable income. If you happen to be in a private non-group insurance plan, that's about 50% of those people will have to spend more than 10% of their disposable income on healthcare. I don't think that exists for most other sectors of the economy. Next. 